This week's Dark Side of the Ring covered the career of Sylvester Ritter, better known to fans as the Junkyard Dog. Another 80s name that I grew up on. I still have an old VHS from my, I think it was my fourth birthday? Fourth birthday party at home? I was I was converting all of them not too uh, long ago, all the old like family videos. And there, and there in the background, in, in my bedroom, I had my old JYD poster hanging on the wall in my room. You know, Vince McMahon, he knew how to market his stars back then, that's for sure. These guys were larger than life. But I never got to see JYD's work outside of WWE until many years later, I started browsing old Mid-South footage on YouTube. And then later, you know, they added it to the network. And, you know, you, you hear the phrase, the rise and fall used a lot. The rise and fall of ECW, the rise and fall of so-and-so. It would be appropriate to use that to describe the Junkyard Dog because he had an incredible rise and it was followed by a pretty sharp fall. You know, one that he never really recovered from. Whereas the the Matt Bourne episode didn't have too many talking heads last week, this one had a ton of talking heads. You had Jim Ross, who knew JYD very well from his days in Mid-South working for Bill Watts. Ted DiBiase, who was partners and rivals with JYD at one time and was one of his best friends, you know. Dog was even the best man at DiBiase's wedding. At one time, DiBiase, he was working in Georgia. Uh, and business was not good. And he, he fell by, and they didn't mention this, but business was not good. I think he fell behind on his child support payments and JYD lent him money. And then years later, when DiBiase was making bank as the Million Dollar Man, and JYD had fallen on some tough times, DiBiase was there for him too. So their friendship lasted many years. Uh, also interviewed for this was Jake the Snake Roberts, Hacksaw Jim Duggan, Coco Beware, Tony Atlas, Jim Cornette, Teddy Long, and they got JYD's nephew, Jarvis Woodburn. So they got a lot of people for this one. So some background on JYD that was not mentioned in the episode. And I like to do this when I do the reviews. Yeah, I review the episode also, but there's just only so much stuff they can include, I guess, you know, in, in 43 minutes. And sometimes they, they neglect stuff that I think really would help make the episode stronger. But one thing they did not mention in the episode, he played college football. He made it to the uh, training camps for the Houston Oilers, as they were back then, and the Green Bay Packers. He got cut by both due to injury. After that, he was working as a deputy sheriff, and one of the other deputies, they worked part-time as a referee for a wrestling promotion, and as physically big as, as you know JYD was, this deputy suggested that he take a stab at pro wrestling, and the rest is history. That's how he got into the business. So he got his start working as Big Daddy Ritter for Stu Hart in Stampede Wrestling. One of the things that people like Tony Atlas and, and Coco Beware talked about in the episode was racism in wrestling at that time. And the idea that in most promotions there was a ceiling for you if you were black or if the promotion had one big, you know, black star, that was it. Like, that was their quota. You weren't going to find two, three, four, you know, African-American stars on top in, in any one promotion. In Mid-South, Bill Watts gave... Junkyard Dog a chance to make real money. And he made Mid-South a lot of money. JYD was like a god to the fans in New Orleans. And Watts had no problem pushing him as his top babyface. But in a place like, you know, the WWF, back in the 80s, Coco said they pushed certain black wrestlers, but they would never go all the way with them. And look, I'm sure that racism played a factor in a lot of situations back then. And I'm not just talking in WWE. But it's also important, I think, to remember who was on top in WWF at the time. Hulk Hogan. And I don't care what color you are, what nationality you are. Hogan was the golden goose. And nobody was taking that spot away from him. So let's not be delusional about that whole thing. Because there were some comments they were making. I'm like, yeah, that's true. But like... Hogan was on top at the times. <laughs> and any promoter in their right mind who had Hulk Hogan was not going to push anybody but Hulk Hogan as their top star at the time. Uh, that's just the fact. Buddy Landell once said, 
Uh, he had never seen anybody as over like the junkyard dog was in his prime. He had never been around Hogan in his prime. But he was around Ric Flair. He said Flair was never over the way the JYD was at the Superdome. But on the subject of racism, there was a story that was published a couple of years ago by a wrestling historian by the name of Al Getz. And he runs a wrestling website called uh, Charting the Territories. And he published this article about a story that had not been told in over 50 years about a young Sylvester Ritter. And he pieced it together through old newspaper clippings. I don't, I don't think anybody even knew this story. But I thought it would be appropriate to mention it here, knowing I was going to be talking about JYD, because it, it was something he experienced at a young age and, you know, is really something to think about, considering how big of a star he went on to become to where his popularity transcended black and white. In 1954, the Supreme Court voted to overturn a lower court decision in the case of Brown versus the Board of, versus the Board of Education. Uh, And it stated that the notion of separate but equal was unconstitutional for public schools. The following year, the court ordered states to desegregate. And even still, there were a lot of schools in North Carolina. They remained segregated. I mentioned North Carolina because JYD grew up in North Carolina. The three school systems in the county that Dog lived in each maintained two separate sets of schools. You had one for whites and you had one for blacks. Years later, after the passage of the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act, families there were given a choice of where they wanted their kids to go to school. And there was a small number of black students who chose to attend what had been the all-white schools. And the belief is that this group included JYD, who played uh, football. He was invited to switch schools by a former coach. That football coach was then confronted by the Grand Dragon of the local KKK chapter, who had two kids of his own in those schools, and he wasn't very happy. And I think that coach ended up leaving the school for fear over his his safety. There were bombings outside the houses of some of the black families who had planned to send their kids to these schools. A lot of really disgusting things came out of this. In 1968, Dr. Martin Luther King is assassinated. And at one of the high schools in the area, there were several black students who walked out of their class in protest over the school not flying the flag at half-mast, out of respect for Dr. King. 34 students got suspended. One of the um, uh, newspaper stories said that there was one student who cursed at the school principal who got expelled for the remainder of the school year, and that student was Sylvester Ritter. Turns out the flag was lowered, but then somebody raised it, someone who didn't have the authority to do so, and that led to everything that happened, right? There's always one person to fuck things up. The NAACP got involved. There were hearings with the school board, lawyers for the students who were expelled, uh, of which JYD was one. He had already enrolled in a different school. I don't believe he was involved in anything else with this moving forward. He probably just wanted to move on with his life, but after high school, he graduated college. He got a degree in political science, which I never knew. And it makes you wonder if those experiences that he had in the late 60s is what led to him taking an interest in political science. Uh, And what level of interest did he actually have in political science? Or was it just something he chose because got to pick something, right? When, When he really just wanted to play football. I mean, look, there were college courses that I took, not because I actually gave a shit about them, but because I was forced to. I had to pick something. So that we'll never know. But up until a year or two ago, I hadn't heard about any of this. I didn't know he was involved in any way, shape, or form with that or what he majored in or anything like that. And it just makes you wonder how that may have, uh, you know, no no pun intended, but how that may have colored his experiences uh, going forward. But JYD, he was the biggest star in Mid-South wrestling. I I don't even think that can be debated. In the early 80s, he was pulling around $150,000 a year, it's been said which was a lot at the time. Uh, But, you know, racism was something that was an issue, even even as big of a star as he was. Uh, Meltzer mentioned this story many years ago when JYD passed away, that Louisiana at the time was probably the most politically corrupt state in the entire country. And in every city, Bill Watts used local promoters who typically, you know, they were old white politicians who didn't really want to be promoting shows with a black man as the top star on the marquee. One of those promoters, this guy George C. Culkin, he didn't even want JYD booked on the shows. 
It didn't matter that he was making the promotion more money than anybody else. He was black. So he didn't want him on there. So JYD, I mean, at least he had a sense of humor, I guess, about the whole thing. Uh, he would do localized interviews for that market, talking about coming to Jackson, Mississippi, and I'm going to go over to my good friend George C. Culkin's house before the matches to eat watermelon and fried chicken before kicking butt later, later that night. And it would drive Culkin absolutely mad to the point where he would call up Bill Watts and he would demand like he wanted JYD fired. He wanted Jim Ross fired because Jim Ross was the one doing the interviews. He wanted JR fired too. Obviously, Bill Watts didn't fire either one of them. Jim Cornette talked about the famous angle where the Freebirds accidentally blinded Dog with a cream that supposedly removed hair instantly, but Dog... Ended up getting it in the eyes instead, and he was rendered blind. He might never see again. And in one of his promos, Dog talked about his daughter being born, and you know he could hold her, but he would never be able to actually see her. You did not want to be one of the Freebirds, because the fans quite literally wanted to see them dead. Uh, the angle was so great, they did it twice. You know, in Georgia, years later, only that second time, JYD only got blinded in one eye. Here in the main angle, it was both eyes. But there was one promo they talked about in the Tales from the Territories episode on Mid-South where Dog says, Here, here's my new baby. And like he's pointing to, to his new child, his newborn. And his wife had to like grab his hand and move it to where the baby was because he was pointing in the wrong direction to sell the fact that he couldn't see. JYD and Hayes, they had a dog collar match in a cage that did... 26,000 fans at the Superdome. Uh, they also told the story of the JYD fan jumping the rail uh, at a show and pulling out a gun. He was aiming it at the Freebirds. JYD didn't know what to do because he was trying to keep kayfabe, right? He's not supposed to see. So if this guy's pointing a gun and he goes to, to tackle him or take the gun away from him, it blows the whole thing. <laughs> this is how they thought back then. I know it sounds silly now, but like he had to take a moment to think, oh shit, what do I do? And thankfully, the cops were there. They tackled the guy before, you know, the guy did something or JYD had to do something. But that's heat. That's heat. You know, I've seen Ted DiBiase talk about nights in New Orleans where he wouldn't drive his own car to the building because he thought it would be destroyed. He would drive with Grizzly Smith and Grizzly would get his tires slashed. Sometimes DiBiase would have to leave the building in the trunk of somebody's car. Like, that's how over JYD was and how much those fans believed back then. His nephew uh, said that he was stunned to learn that his uncle had groupies on the road and they would pay to have sex with him. Tony Atlas said he loved it because he got free beer and he got laid just by hanging out with Dog. He told one story about the night three women came into their room and they each paid $100 to have sex with them. And Dog told the women, he goes, look, uh... Tony doesn't want to have sex with you. He just wants to play with your feet. It's like, ah, here we go. The famed Tony Atlas foot fetish. I, I, I see it goes back even to those days. Suddenly there's a knock at the door and it was the husband of one of the women. He wanted to fight JYD and that, you know, that didn't end well for him. And Tony said, dog beat the hell out of him and the girl stayed. <laughs> Amazing. I would like to think that's a true story. But again, with, when it comes to this stuff, you get the old timers telling stories and there are people who aren't around anymore and, you know, what, what what's real and what's not. It makes for a great story, though. And then, unfortunately, the drugs started to take their toll, as they always seem to do in these stories. And he started taking all kinds of stuff, cocaine being the one that really did a number on him. And a lot of wrestlers were using cocaine back then, but JYD was, I mean, he was into it pretty hardcore. In 1984, though, Vince McMahon came calling. He offered JYD double what Bill Watts was paying him. So he left. No notice. He just up and left. And it was customary to give at least a few weeks notice back then to the promoter so they could finish you up. Or if you were a champion, they could get the belt off of you. But in this case, he just disappeared and no-showed. He was scheduled for a bunch of main events in different markets against uh, Butch Reed. And he immediately showed up on WWF television. And that hurt Bill Watts because he considered JYD to be a friend. He pushed him as his top star for many years and paid him well. So he felt hurt and, and betrayed. And he went on his television show and he buried him on commentary. I've heard stories before 
of Vince McMahon paying guys extra. Like even like a bonus. A signing bonus, I guess you would say. To leave their territory without giving notice. So I would not at all be surprised if Dog wanted to do business the right way, but the money was just too good to pass up, and it was a Vince McMahon call for him to leave without giving notice, because that's exactly the sort of thing I would expect Vince McMahon back then to do. Uh, Coco said that he was amazed to see a white man crying over a black man leaving, and he credited Bill Watts for doing what he did for Dog. Now, it is worth mentioning that in the same episode, Teddy Long says that he was told by JYD himself that he was in the men's room one day, using one of the stalls. Bill Watts and Grizzly Smith walked in without knowing that JYD was in there. And supposedly, JYD overheard them talking. Grizzly was telling Bill Watts, hey, you know, we're going to lose dog to the WWF. And Watts allegedly responded by assuring him, don't worry, that N-word isn't going anywhere. And according to Teddy, that's what caused JYD to make up his mind and jump to the WWF. And they did put a message on screen here during the episode to let us know that they reached out to Bill Watts for comment and he denied that that ever happened. So Watts, you know, at this point, he's scared to death about losing his territory because he just lost his, his meal ticket. And he tried to replace JYD with another black star. They tried George Wells... Uh, Brickhouse Brown, The Snowman, not Tony Khan, uh, Butch Reed, who had a great look, but that was part of the problem. He looked too polished. He looked too pretty with the big physique. He didn't come across like an everyman that the fans could relate to like they related to JYD, so none of them worked. And Coco said he thinks JYD felt that Vince McMahon was going to push him the way that Bill Watts did as, as his top guy. And that never happened. And like I said before, that was never going to happen because Vince McMahon did not need JYD on top or anybody else when he had Hulk Hogan. You know, JYD was still pushed, but he was never going to get the Hogan push. And that had nothing to do with the way he looked. That spot was already taken. Vince already had his guy. Everybody else was basically a strong supporting player. He built a very strong supporting cast of characters by raiding all of the other territories. And it worked for him. It's what won him the war. JYD basically became the number two babyface in the company behind Hogan when he first came in. He was making somewhere in the range of $400,000 a year. Jim Ross said that Dog once told him he made hundred grand in royalties alone for one quarter. Just from his action figure. I assume that was the LJN figure. The Hasbros didn't come out until many years later. Dog was gone by then. I don't know what other action figure or doll it would have been if not the LJN figures. I I had all the LJNs. I had the JYD one too. I have no idea where it is now. (laughs) You know what's weird about the LJN figures though? Uh, I did keep some of them. Some of them were junked. Some of them were lost. I have a small box. I, I do still have some of them. And I don't know. I don't know what happened. But I don't want to say they melted. They didn't melt. And it's not like the box is next to a furnace or anything like that. They're in a closet. I I was cleaning out the closet one day, like last year, I think it was. And I said, oh, here's, you know, what's in the box. And it's the LJNs. And I go to pick them up and they're all like, ugh, I don't know. Something happened to the material. They're all sticky and shit. I have no idea what happened to these things. But, you know, you have these giant rubber figures They've just been sitting in the fucking box for so long. I'm like, what happened to my LJNs? But yeah, no, I mean, I, again, I grew up on that, man. You know, I, I had, I had all that stuff and, and JYD was one of them. But yeah, he made bank off, off the, uh, the action figures alone. You know, he was part of the Hulk Hogan rock and wrestling cartoon. He did a music video for his song, Grab Them Cakes, which is a fucking fantastic song, by the way. You know, he never won a title. He never won a title in WWE, uh, but he was part of one of the all-time great glory periods in wrestling. He was on the first WrestleMania, wrestling for the Intercontinental title. He was on the first episode of Saturday Night's Main Event. He won the Wrestling Classic in 1985. He beat Randy Savage in the finals. He was being pushed pretty well, and then the problems started to get worse. He would be smoking crack out in the open, even on airplanes. It wasn't like he was trying to hide it. Tony Atlas said he was in a limo once with JYD. They were heading uh, in for one of those old Tuesday Night Titans tapings that they did in studio. Uh, 
And Dog made the limo driver make a detour. He said, go to the hood, as he said, so that he could get dope. And then he asked the limo driver if he could smoke in the car. And the driver thought he was talking about cigarettes. He's like, yeah, sure. And then Dog pulls out a crack pipe and the driver starts freaking out. You know, he said JYD forgot what Thunderbolt Patterson told them once upon a time. Thunderbolt Patterson told them, you can't do what the white man do and keep your job. And I'm, I'm sure there was a lot of truth to that back then. I'm sure that was a very true statement. Hacksaw said, look, I can't throw stones because I was doing a lot of drugs back then too. But he said, I never got addicted to any of it the way the dog did. And you could probably say the same for Jake Roberts too. Some, some people just have an addictive personality. It's one of those, it's just one of those things you hear about these wrestlers or really any athlete or musician or entertainer and you know the, the the drugs are plentiful people have drug problems people have alcohol problems why is it that some people can have uh, a drug problem or an alcohol problem and then either they just can quit cold turkey or maybe not cold turkey maybe they go to rehab once and they get it licked and they're fine and they're able to control you know control their urges and why is it that other people who who want to try everything and they just can't they'll go their whole life and it's just they they just can't do it right some people just they have an addictive personality and some don't by the time he got to wrestlemania 3 he was jobbing to harley race in four minutes and vince mcmahon had largely protected jyd from doing jobs when he came in but by this point he was being pushed at he yeah he was he was not being pushed at that level anymore that he was being pushed at when he first came in Jake said, as far as he knows, Dog lost his job because of no-shows. And, you know, it, it's hard to push somebody when they become unreliable. It's one of the reasons Kerry Von Erich never got a huge push in the WWF. And I, I know he won the Intercontinental title, his first big match. And then he dropped it, what was it, two months later, three months later? He dropped the championship? I, I can never be sure because back then they would tape those syndicated shows so far in advance. I mean, some of them were t- taped a month in advance. But he didn't have the Intercontinental title for more than maybe a a couple of months. When he beat Ric Flair to win the NWA title, you know, Kerry only had it for, what, 18 days, I think it was, because he was completely unreliable. Also, drugs. He stopped training. He let his weight get out of control, which is where the whole junk food dog stuff comes from. You know, Meltzer gets blamed for that because he would call him the junk food dog in The Observer. It actually wasn't Dave who came up with the insult. I've heard two different versions of this. In one of them, it was Jim Ross who came up with it uh, during the Mid-South days because he would have JR, uh, Dog would have JR go on junk food runs for him. Uh, he Apparently, he loved his Twinkies and candy bars. I mean, look, I understand. I think also, I remember reading, though, once that JR said that maybe it was Ernie Ladd's nickname for him. And in any event, that's actually where the whole junk food dog thing comes from. Apparently, it was something known within the business, and I guess Meltzer must have heard it one day, and he started using it, you know, in the newsletter when Dog's weight started to balloon, because he got very big. JYD got a brief run in WCW. It was very forgettable. He was a shell of himself by that point. Uh, He worked a part-time job later on at Walmart. He didn't save his money. You know, that, and he also lost a lot of it in his second divorce. So, So, JYD had two failed marriages. The first one is actually a whole story all by itself. The first one was quite a bit different um, than the second one because his wife, his first wife, had to be institutionalized. Now, I don't know what the circumstances were around that, if it had to do with JYD and his lifestyle at the time, but whatever the reasons were, she was put away. And then one night, she got out of the hospital, either that or she escaped. I... I (laughs) I'm just picturing Michael Myers escaping from Smith Grove and stealing the nurse's car and driving off. Anyway, she got out of the hospital. And the first thing she did was she went to his parents' house and kidnapped her own daughter. Their daughter was living with uh, JYD's parents while he was out on the road for WWF. When he found out, he immediately got on a plane home and he went to his brother-in-law's house. He broke down the door. The brother just so happened to be a local police officer, and he tried to stop him, and the two of them wrestled around for the gun, which went off, and the brother, the cop, got shot. I don't think he was killed, but I know, I think it was ruled an accidental shooting. 
So how's that for a wild story, right? And then when his second marriage ended, I think he lost his car, he lost his house. I'm sure he must have lost money too. So between that and him spending a lot of that money on drugs, he ended up broke. And in the episode, Tony Atlas said he went through a similar phase where you never think the money is going to end. You think that spigot is just going to be on and it's going to just be flowing for forever and ever. And you're always going to be a big star until one day... You're not. You're not a big star. Tony said he ended up homeless at one point. He tried to kill himself. This was right before Vince McMahon brought him back in that terrible Saba Simba gimmick. As silly as that was, that gimmick is probably what saved his life because the money he made, he was able to get back on stable footing. JYD's last appearance, at least with a national promotion, uh, was a, a month before his death. And it was for ECW. ECW had a pay-per-view called Wrestlepalooza in 98. Uh, That was the night he got into the famous fight with New Jack backstage. New Jack claimed that uh, JYD borrowed, quote-unquote borrowed, $300 worth of weed from him. Once upon a time. Never paid him back. This was years before. I don't know how many years, but it was years before. And New Jack never forgot that. So years later, here's Junkyard Dog. He's backstage at the ECW show. I think they had a bunch of legends. They were going to send them out there for an appearance that night. And New Jack sees him. And New Jack comes over. He sucker punches Dog right in the face. And Dog got some shots in on him too, apparently. And and before JYD went out to the ring for his appearance, they had to give him a different t-shirt because the shirt he was wearing had blood on it. Because that's just how it was back in the day in ECW. I guess that's just how the way things were. Uh, New Jack never forgot the uh, the money that he was owed. He was gonna he was gonna make him pay for it. And then he passed away a month later, and his death was a sad one. Uh, he tried to make it in time to his daughter Latoya's high school graduation in North Carolina. He was driving in nine hours. He was driving in from Mississippi. By the time he got there, it was hours after the graduation had already ended. And they didn't mention this in the episode, but by the time he got there. Uh, His daughter had already left to go spend the night with friends. And the next morning, when she found out he had uh, driven in to see her, is when she also found out that he had passed away. Now, he did get to visit with his nephew. And he got to hold his nephew's uh, newborn son for the first time. They showed a photo. I think that was probably the last photo ever taken of JYD. Uh, He gassed the car up. He was ready to make the drive back. He told his nephew, uh, I don't need to sleep, I'll be fine. The nephew said when the car door was open, he noticed, he looked inside, and it looked like puke all over the driver's side door. Uh, And Dog said, look, he'll be back on the 4th. I I think that meant the uh, 4th of July. He'll be back to visit on the 4th of July. And it was June 1st, 1998, when he, he died. He was only 45 years old. He fell asleep behind the wheel. There were no skid marks on the road. He flipped the car three times without his seatbelt on, which his nephew said wasn't a surprise because his uncle was too big at that point to even wear a seatbelt. And he shouldn't have even been in that size of a car to begin with. But the autopsy noted that the cause of death was head trauma. And this one, this one hits a little different for me now because it's almost the exact same way that my father died. So I know what that's like to get that phone call the next morning. It's just something that you don't forget. So for all the years that he spent in the business, all the money he made and and made other people, uh, the friends that he made, there was only one wrestler who attended his funeral. That was Buddy Landell, who spoke at the funeral. Yeah, we hear about that a lot. It's it's a weird thing when it comes to wrestling, and I, I don't quite know what it is. But, you know, when Mean Gene passed away, Mean Gene Okerlund, I was shocked. When I found out how few of his of his peers actually attended his funeral. It was like a handful of people, maybe. JYD's nephew took us to visit JYD's grave, which is next to where his daughter is buried. Latoya is the one who accepted the Hall of Fame induction on her father's behalf back in 2004. She passed away in 2011. She was only 31 years old. Uh, died of a ruptured heart valve. One minute she was talking on the phone... The next, her friend heard a loud thud. Doctor said she was gone before she even hit the floor. That's how quickly life can be taken away from us. So look, I mean, they don't call it Dark Side of the Ring for nothing. Um, 
Jim Ross said that he hoped Dog's story could be a cautionary tale, you know, of somebody who had it all and then let his demons get the better of him, and he threw it all away. Uh, I didn't learn much in the way of new information from the episode, but if somebody only knew him from the WWF run that he had, they got to see a whole other side of him from his Mid-South days, because as far as him in the ring and as a draw and a box office attraction, he had his best run before he ever started working for Vince McMahon. Even though that's where he made the most money. And that's where a lot of people like me, growing up back in the mid-80s, as a wrestling fan, knew him from. His best run, I guess, again, best being a word that people may define in different ways. uh, But arguably, his best run came before he ever went to the WWF. Uh, 